writer Calvin Trillin once remarked that uh, his mother only ever cooked with leftovers, and that in fact it had been, she had been cooking with leftovers for so many years that the original meal had never been found. <laughs> Uh, I feel a little bit like the caboose on this train here. Uh, this is the last of the uh, of these sort of short styles, and all of the kind of uh, what did Vince call them yesterday? The big ideas. Um, I feel like they've all been taken, <laughs> sort of. But I think uh, I w when I was thinking about that, as Elizabeth was mentioning earlier. Um, probably all of us uh, as presenters have had the same experience that, uh, except uh, Lama Suryadas, because he went first, but uh, each person saying things um, uh, would uh, affect how we ourselves were um, anticipating, presenting what it was we thought we were going to say. <clears throat> One of the uh, things that is important to mention, I'm, the title of my talk, Aesthetic Anesthetic, um, is it's important for me to mention that I'm talking as an artist. Uh, I'm a practicing artist. I've been doing painting and drawing and music all my life. And I'm also uh, a, a practicing meditator. I don't know if that makes me a Buddhist artist or not. The term gives me the creeps, frankly. But, um, <laughs> In any case, the two things together have been uh, my path for the past 40 years uh, of uh, looking at both. Uh, the experience of uh, creativity or um, artistic investigation along with a meditative investigation. <clears throat> and I wanted to use a word that's somewhat, somewhat dangerous here at the beginning. And I, and, it's, uh, it appears in the sutras, as Michael mentioned just in his talk this morning, the word uh, delight occurs in a, in a way that we think, uh-oh. And uh, it, I'm going to be using the word delight in a slightly different way than the way it is translated from the Buddha's words into English. Because I think it's an extremely important ingredient to how we proceed on the path. Anyone has been, who has been practicing meditation earnestly and diligently for a long time uh, will have at some point sooner or later, and it usually comes up from behind and sort of pinches them in the ass, uh, and that is an experience of delight. It's actually an experience of relief, of delight. And what, uh, this delight that I'm talking about is not, um, it's not titillation. It's not wowie zowie. It's actually the absence of something. It's the absence of uh, grasping. It's actually um, realizing that there is this quality that is already fully developed. It needs no upgrade. It needs uh, no enhancement. It, is, it has no allegiance to accepting and rejecting. It has no opinion. It has no ethnicity. It has no water. <laughs> it's everywhere. Oh, I have some slides too. While I drink water, here, we'll look at a slide. You can't really see the slides, the slides here, can you? Oh, that's so much better. That's a form of delight, by the way. <laughs> and it's very simple, and it doesn't cost any, well, we don't want to get too far into it, but you know, there are simple moments of relief in our life that, um, that have to, uh, to do with, in a certain way, nothing. It's just I have nothing to do with anything. It's just... So all of the different things and the big ideas that I wanted to say have been said already in different ways, but I wanted to proceed a little bit here from an artistic point of view, and, the, and as a teacher, I teach at Naropa University right here in Boulder, and I teach art classes and meditation classes, and I uh, try to combine both of those things. 
And I have some observations about how, um, how artistic practice um, is a way of engaging phenomena uh, in a way that can lead to delight. It can provoke delight. It can relieve us from a lot of things if it's approached um, properly or clearly or without confusion, which is impossible, by the way. Um, And I have some observations because I've been at this for a long time, and there are um, things about uh, digital phenomena, you know, the digital engagement that, um, that both thrill me and worry me. And I want to talk a little bit about some of those things. And um, one of them is uh, the issue that comes to my mind is the issue of continuity, the continuity of experience. And um, there are three aspects to that that I, that I notice, and these are somewhat pulled out of a hat. Uh, one of them is uh, simply the continuity of attention. But because we have cell phones and we have laptops and we have all of these things, there's uh, now uh, this uh, a possibility of continual interruption. Uh, those of us that are a little bit older, you know, somewhat get used to it. Uh, uh, some of you, uh, it's, I've been interesting observing the generations here in this talk. Is Amber here? No. Um, I, I, was in, I was wondering how old she was, because um, she actually is not a younger generation person. She's somewhere in between. I think of anyone under 50 as being young. But she's probably, what would you say? Let's, let's guess here. 34? 25? Oh. 20, well, she doesn't sleep. Maybe she looks a little older because she doesn't get any sleep. <laughs> When she was describing uh, soldering things with her father, you know, making, I realized she is actually from an older generation than people who just uh, grow up, you know, and they, you know, they, they have cell phones at the age of five. And, and people who are in their teens now are actually in a different generation than children now who, um, who will pick up a, an iPhone and start using it, which many of you have seen probably. So there are, uh, there are actually different stages uh, within this. But, but the thing that concerns me, back to this idea of continuity, is um, what happens when our attention is interrupted continuously? What happens to us? You know, I read all of these studies, we all do probably, about um, you know, what, what, what's, what's happening to us with all of this digital media. Um, you know, and there are reports that say uh, there, it's expanding our boundaries, you know, in, in, ways that are unimaginable in human history. And other reports are saying, this is so fucking up the whole species, we just don't even know what's going to happen next. <laughs> you know? And I've come to the conclusion that they're all true. They're actually all true. The potential for uh, expansion is it's tremendous. I mean, how thrilling is, is the internet? It's so thrilling. I mean, you just anything you want. And how weird is it? and how in strange, strangely how disconnected it is and how disconnecting it can be in all of the time we spend on it. I spend way too much time at a computer. So that's the issue of continuity of, of, of attention, uh, which um, I'll just uh, leave that open for the moment. Uh, the other one uh, is the continuity of um, social norms that there was a time <laughs> not that long in the past where it was considered rude to be doing something else while somebody was talking to you. That was actually, you know, it was just a, a basic training, you know, like, like don't interrupt, you know, you, know you, you wait, you know, you pay attention. It actually requires attention. And now, I mean, it's, it's sort of, you know, people are tweeting, twittering, texting, and doing stuff all the time. I tell my students in my classes, to uh, turn off the phones, no, and no texting. We'll, you'll be okay. We'll take a break, and an hour and a half, you can, you, can, you can do whatever you want. We'll take a short break, and when the break's over, shut it off. We're here in a room together, we're talking. You know, that's a, um, that's a very simple uh, issue of, uh, you could say, uh, cultural norms. And uh, there's a lot that we could talk about with that. I was thinking about that um, um, yesterday in the, um, who's, who was talking about uh, uh, McLuhan? Ken, 
Ken was talking about Marshall McLuhan and that the um, that you know when a new technology comes in, some things go out the window. And I thought, hmm, what's gone out the window with uh, you know with texting and iPhones and stuff? Uh, and one of them might be you know sort of uh, good manners, <laughs> which is. Uh, I like in the Century Theaters, uh, they say, you know, they, they used to say, you know, please turn off your cell phone. <laughs> now they say, um, your texting and <laughs> tweeting can wait till after the movie. Don't make us ask you to leave. You know, I mean, they have this really strident sign. It's actually really cool. It's like, in case you didn't get it the first time, shut the thing up. I mean, have you ever been in a theater and, you know, like the, suddenly the screen lights up in front of you because somebody's uh, tweeting the movie? But I think a lot of it is just that we're, it's, the technology is new and we're new at it. So, um, you know, maybe we're learning it as we go along. And um, the other uh, third part of this continuity is the uh, continuity of um, history, which uh, I just this minute decided not to talk about. <laughs> so, um, b because there was something that I, that I did want to say, and it's about uh, practicing as an artist. Uh, which we haven't talked about at all in this conference, practically. You know, I mean, this uh, artistic practice is completely overlooked as a mode of inquiry. Uh, it's very ancient. Um, I use uh, this burnt stick to draw with that has been in constant use by human beings for over 40,000 years. And when I pick up the burnt stick and I draw with it, it's a piece of charcoal, you know? I mean, it's, it, but it's so ancient and so old, and there's this feeling of connectedness. And I think, what, what caused human beings to start doing this? You know, take a stick, draw on the sand, you know, draw on a surface. What does this? Try drawing, and it's, I'm not talking about, you know, skilled, uh, groovy training drawing, and just uh, pick up a, any tool and look at something and trace the shape of it with a tool. Try this sometime and see what happens. Something amazing uh, 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 con in uh, connecting you to phenomena occurs that's very physical and it's very real. A couple of weeks ago, I read an, art, uh, an article in the New Yorker magazine about an artist named Matthew Jensen, um, who, um, uh, what caught my attention in the article was uh, uh, Ian Fraser, the writer, was describing him. Uh, and. He said, you know, he just said he's 31 years old, he's, you know, tall, he's this and that, uh, but his eyes have a special brightness that comes from use. His eyes have a special brightness that comes from use. And what Matthew Jensen does is he lives in Brooklyn and he, he, he walks around and he looks for things. He just looks. He's always looking. He had a, a very uh, large piece uh, recently purchased by the Metropolitan Museum in New York, which is a wonderful thing for a 31-year-old artist. And it's all done on Google Earth, Street View. So he's a total geek, but he also knows how to mix up the physical, uh, physical investigation with the world with the digital, and to, uh, how to alternate between the two in such a way that his eyes have this brightness from use. How many of us could honestly say that after sitting at a computer for four hours that our eyes have a brightness that comes from use? <laughs> You know, it's more like, where's the visine? And I think um, um, Lama Suryadas made a, a comment, uh, this quote about uh, the, the prana in cyberspace is thin. It's thin. It's there, but it's thin. So learning how to distinguish between what is, um, you know, what is actually physically real, how do we engage, um, how do we engage physical phenomena in such a way that it's, um, that we understand the difference between what is physically present and what is represented. This is an old question, by the way. This is a way pre-digital question. How do, you, how do you understand the difference between those things? The word aesthetic, by the way, um, the original Greek meaning of the word uh, means what is felt or perceived. Uh, later, much later, it, it got this rather controversial use as being the branch of philosophy dealing with beauty and so forth. And when I say aesthetics here, it's, I'm talking about this, um, uh, this, what is perceived, what is felt, how do we do that? How do we do that with our sense perceptions? And anesthetic, obviously we know what that means. And in this context, it's the exact opposite. What anesthetizes us to phenomena, to the physical world, to ourselves? 
and many have said this already before this, so I'm not going to go into it too uh, deeply, but with uh, one exception, and that is that um, how do we use an iPhone, and the iPhone seems to be a principal culprit here, I have one myself, how do we use the iPhone to deny ourselves the opportunity to experience space? We do this. You know, whenever it's uncomfortable, it's like, and you see people, you know, uh, in restaurants, walking down the street, and there is something about um, uh, learning the discipline, and we can do this, of how to actually um, not do that. You know, it's the same. It's, this, is, this is like basic old Buddhist practice in a way. You know, when the mind goes off, you know, you, you bring it back. How do you actually, uh, how do you keep some kind of uh, stability of practice, of awareness? Which uh, leads me just to a final thing, and that is that, um, as Elizabeth was saying, what the Buddha was teaching 25 centuries ago um, really holds up. You know, it, it's, it, it actually holds up. There's no, uh, the fact that phenomena are impermanent uh, is not a debatable, this is not a debatable, you know, no, it's, it's, it, they don't. The fact that, we, that it, there is impermanence and that we will die is not debatable. The fact that this whole circumstance that we are in is unstable, it always has been unstable. The problems that we face now are just today's version of, the, of that instability. Over the ages, it's been plague, famine, war, all of it. So coming back to the thing of delight is very important. How do you actually let go of all of what we think we can do or should do or ought to do and just be with what is? Interestingly, as Michael was saying, that when we're with, with what is, we start encountering what actually can be helped, what can be addressed, what can, can be seen. And just at one final uh, comment, uh, in Tibet in the 1950s, there was a very uh, provocative teacher named Kenpo Gangshar, and he influenced a lot of the teachers who made it out of Tibet um, ahead of the Chinese invasion. And one of the things that Kenpo Gangshar said again and again and again was he, you know, indicated the entire monastic system of Tibet that had been, you know, flourishing for a millennium. And, and he said, if you don't understand how to wake up directly right within the phenomena of this, right within this, he said, that's, that's you need to know how to wake up right within this. All of the decorations, the paintings, the sound, the rituals, the cultural structure, he said, it's not going to be there. He knew that it was not going to be there in, in, in fairly short order. And he said, if you can't just wake up right now, right within this, you're in trouble. If you think it depends on that structure, watch out. And, you know, that applies to all of us right now, that everything is so... Uh, Shaky, always has been. So don't forget delight. And I'm serious about delight. It's hardcore delight, you could say. Okay, maybe that's it. Thank you. <laughs>